How is everybody doing today? All my space campers, let me hear you. That is awesome. You guys must be having a great time here at space camp. All right, who's going to be an astronaut? Raise your hand. Good. Well, you know, we've got some astronauts here this weekend. I'm sure you guys have heard from them already. It's Thursday, right? You guys have astronaut speakers today. All right. So I am Trevor Daniels. I do uh, government relations here at the center, and I myself am a Space Camp alum back from 96. So dreams can come true. I grew up with this place, and now I'm working here, and it's awesome. Um, so tonight, uh, we're here for a Pass the Torch. It's an inspirational lecture series, and uh, tonight is going to be probably our most inspirational um, that, that we've ever had here. Um, so tonight, you're going to hear from a group of very special people to Space Camp and the Space Camp family. They are our Hall of Fame members, and they're going to share their stories um, about their amazing careers and how it started right here, where you guys are, having fun, meeting new people, figuring out what you want to do with your lives. Um, for them, it all started at Space Camp, and they've kept that passion in their hearts all through their careers. And they've, done, they've gone on to do different things. It's a very diverse crowd. I mean, we've got uh, reporters, we've got uh, nonprofits, uh, people that are uh, in the military, people that are working at Marshall Space Flight Center over there right across the mountain, uh, doing things with the ISS. It's an amazing crew. We've got research scientists. Anything's possible, and hopefully you've learned that here at your week at Space Camp. So I don't want to take up any more of your time. I'm going to uh, briefly uh, tell you the names of our panelists and then turn it over uh, to our moderator. So speaking tonight, we have Dr. Andrea Hansen, Lieutenant Colonel Burke Hare, uh, Michelle Lucas, Major Philip Smith, Robert Perlman, Penny Pettigrew, Vincent Vazo, Joshua Whitfield. So those are, that's who you're going to hear from, but we also have some uh, Hall of Fame members in the audience tonight. Um, we have uh, Liz Warren, Dr. Liz Warren, uh, Dottie Metcalf-Lindenberger, who was the, the first uh, alumna in space, um, followed by uh, a couple of other special people. Uh, we have Dan Oates as well. Let's give a round of applause to all our Hall of Fame members, because they are awesome. Now... Without further, I'm going to let them tell you their stories and their backgrounds. Uh, I can't do it justice, honestly. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, an inductee from the 2008 class and the liaison to the Alumni Advancement Board, which is another group of alumni. So when you all get home, you, if your parents let you, get on uh, you know, Google or whatever and uh, look up the Alumni uh, Advancement Board and join. It's an awesome community. We're everywhere. And uh, these people are, are leading the charge to, uh, to change the future. So uh, please, Major Smith. Thank you very much. Sweet. I have the microphone and the caveat, the uh, coveted clicker that uh, will hopefully get through this. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, we're all humbled and grateful to be here with you today. Uh, we're here to give back to you guys, kind of tell you where we came from and all that uh, good jazz. You'll see, like uh, was mentioned before, a very diverse group uh, of individuals talking tonight. And then we've got questions and uh, comments afterwards. So um, we do have one of our Hall of Famers who isn't here yet. He'll be here any minute. Uh, Major John Hecker, who's getting inducted into the Hall of Fame this, uh, this year. The dinner's tomorrow. And uh, Major Hecker is a C-130 pilot in the United States Marine Corps. For those of you that didn't see the news, uh, United States Marine Corps C-130 crashed the other day, losing a total of 16 crew members on board. So if we could have about a 10-second moment of silence for those who passed in the C-130 crash, really appreciate that. Without further ado, again, we're glad to be here. We really appreciate uh, you guys coming in and uh, listening to us and hopefully asking us some questions. Uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, uh, Sergeant Josh Whitfield, United States Army retired. Off to you, Josh. This is, uh, this is me 110 pounds ago in 2008. 
He's a good looking guy. I miss him. Uh, as uh, Major, Major Rich said, my name is Josh Whitfield. Uh, I uh, went to Aviation Challenge uh, 16 times here in Alabama, another four times in Aviation Challenge California. So I went to Aviation, uh, Aviation Challenge quite a bit. When I was a kid, I started in Mach 2 uh, in Aviation Challenge California. When Aviation Challenge California shut down, I had but one place to go, and that was to come all the way out here to Alabama uh, to continue uh, my career with Aviation Challenge. Aviation Challenge was very uh, special for me uh, because uh, I th it's, it takes you out of your element. I think the best part, as you guys have all uh, figured out this week, is you get, to, uh, you get to leave your home, you get to leave your friends behind, you get to leave your parents behind, you get to leave your chores behind, right? Can I get an amen? Get to leave our chores behind? All right. All right. Uh, but it really, uh, it really brought me out of my element, and I, I believe the counselors who were here uh, back then uh, did more for me in a week than any of my teachers or my coaches. I played uh, football, basketball, uh, baseball, and golf. Um, but it was just a tremendous, life-changing experience for me. Um, without, without a doubt, uh, Aviation Challenge and here at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center uh, was my favorite thing to look forward to every year. Um, so uh, I had a kind of a decorated career as, uh, I don't know if there's any AC teams in the room, but uh, you know, when you, when you mimic a fighter pilot, you gotta have a little bit of a fighter pilot's arrogance, as you'll see later from Major Ritz, all right? Uh, uh, so I was very proud to, uh, I'm a uh, three-time Top Gun Award winner, uh, five-time Right Stuff Award winner, but most important to me is uh, out of my 16 times here in Alabama, uh, 10 of my teams uh, uh, won the Team Flag Awards, which was, was very exciting. I came back in 2009 uh, to be a crew trainer here, uh, where, uh, where I was the uh, counselor Top Gun winner, uh, which is very important. Um, I was a part of the first 12-day camps here, um, and I brought close quarters combat training uh, team building exercise, and I brought paintball here to Aviation Challenge before I left to my uh, big boy career. Uh, before I, I came back here, after, uh, after I left uh, Aviation Challenge, I enlisted in the Army at 17. 9-11 uh, was a major, was a major uh, decision maker for me. I was a freshman in, uh, excuse me, a freshman in high school when 9-11 uh, happened, uh, and I had a Short but distinguished Army career. I uh, was an airborne air assault uh, graduate. Uh, jumped out of airplanes and fast roped out of helicopters, which is a lot of fun. Um, I was a distinguished graduate from the United States Army Sniper School in 2006. I uh, was a designated marksman for my uh, troop in 4-2 Cavalry. I served in uh, Iraq with 125 Infantry, uh, JSOC, and 2nd Cavalry. Uh, I was a part of the 2007 Iraq surge as my th in my third deployment. Uh, the two big battles I fought in my career was the Second Battle of Fallujah and the Battle of Al-Hadar. Uh, I'm a recipient of the Bronze Star Medal and the Purple Heart, and today I'm a national uh, veterans advocate. So today, uh, it was very important to me, uh, I was wounded in Easter Sunday, 2008. I took an RPG hit uh, to my vehicle. I was, uh, evac uh, in a, I was evacuated to uh, Launchville Regional Medical Center in Germany in a coma. Uh, it would come out of my coma and be further evacuated to Walter Reed Medical Center and then to Palo Alto, California, um, where the Army decided that they were done with me, that uh, my injuries were too severe to continue. Uh, so it was important to me from the lessons that I learned here at Space Camp uh, and Aviation Challenge that I knew no matter what I did is that I wanted to continue to serve. And because I couldn't serve my country in combat arms anymore, I, I reached out to find uh, other ways to serve, other ways to serve the country. Um, today I, I am a national political operative. Um, I, I, I work in elections and in politics. Uh, I'm in Washington, D.C. all the time advocating for NASA and STEM funding. That's my personal pet project uh, because uh, we need to start putting people back on Mars and on moons and other planets here in our solar system. Uh, on to Mars, right? Give me an amen. So with the Space Camp Hall of Fame, I work with my colleagues here to uh, fundraise uh, for scholarships. I speak in middle and high, uh, middle and high schools um, 
uh, across the western United States and I always wear, uh, wear my flight suit or something from Space Camp and Aviation Challenge in the hopes that I can motivate another young person like you to come sit here for a week uh, in Alabama and be touched and be inspired to do something great with their lives. Uh, today, uh, uh, I'm on uh, talk radio, uh, national talk radio all the time, talking about uh, all kinds of issues and uh, uh, I was just hired to be my own national syndicated podcast host, which is going to start next month. I'm very excited about that. But I think the most important thing for me is uh, I'm also an elected official. Uh, my, my town, my hometown, I went back to my hometown after the military. And uh, uh, I was elected to the city council, and, and there I get to give back to my hometown. It's not a, it doesn't pay a whole lot, uh, but uh, it's all about giving back. It's all about seeing uh, your hard work pay off and the hard work of others around you pay off. And uh, I hope that uh, as you listen to much more interesting people than me today, uh, that you take these, uh, take these lessons and that you all are inspired to do good works, do your homework, study hard, never give up, and go achieve your dreams because your generation has, is the most blessed and the, most, uh, uh, the, great, the, the, the generation that I truly believe uh, the, you people sitting right here will be the, the, the first humans that get a step on Mars and beyond and take mankind truly into the unknown. So thanks for listening to me today. I'm proud of each and every one of you. I wish you all the best of luck as you head back to school after this summer, and you all have a great evening. It is, uh, it is my sincere honor to now introduce my friend, a member of the inaugural, the first ever uh, uh, Space Camp Hall of Fame class in 2007, Mrs. Paycom Penny Pettigrew. Thank you very much, Josh. Hi, everybody. I'm Penny. I actually uh, took a slightly different route than Josh did to get here. I'm from San Diego, California, if there's from any Californians in the group. And there was this little movie out in the 80s called Space Camp. And I saw the movie in a theater, and I said, I want to go there. And at the very end of the movie, for any of you guys that haven't seen it, it says, filmed on location, Space Camp, Huntsville, Alabama. I'm in California. I had no idea where Huntsville, Alabama was. I didn't know there was a NASA center in Huntsville, Alabama. All I knew is that movie said I could play astronaut in Huntsville, and that's where I wanted to go. Now, it took a while. You know, it's not just the tuition, it's the airfare and everything else to get here. I'm sure all your parents let you know how much it takes to get you there. So thank your parents for sending you. I still thank my mom for sending me because it set me on the path that got me where I am today. It took me until I was a freshman in college to actually get to space camp. So that meant I had to go to adult camp. And back then it was only a three-day program. So I was seeing all the kids get to do these week-long camps and the long missions and everything. And even though what I got to do was fun, I was jealous of you guys because you got to do it for twice as long. So later, after I got out of college, got a job, you know, started a real life, I came back because now they had a week-long adult camp. And I got to do those long duration missions. And I got to swim in the UAT. And I got to do Area 51 out there. And I got to do all the cool stuff I was jealous of you guys for getting to do. So that's when I really felt like a Space Camp alum, is when I got to do all that cool stuff. And then I become a mom. And my daughter comes out here with me all the time. And she wants to do Space Camp, of course. Well, you can't do Space Camp until you're seven. And that's when you do the parent-child camp or the family camp. So as soon as she turned seven, we were out here doing family camp. And she was my commander, and I was her pilot. And she was my flight director, and I was her Capcom. So together, we have become a space camp family. So what do I do now? Now I work at the Marshall Space Flight Center, the NASA that I never knew was in Alabama until I came to space camp. I literally would not be here today had I not gone to space camp because I didn't know any of this was here. When I came, they taught us that there's a university right across the interstate, the University of Alabama in Huntsville. After I graduated from college, I wanted to go to grad school because I was still interested in doing space stuff. After going to space camp, I learned that there's a lot more to NASA than just an astronaut. I grew up wanting to be an astronaut, just like you guys. 
But I learned about all the other people on the ground that support the astronauts during their missions. And I wanted, if I couldn't be an astronaut, I at least wanted to do space stuff. So I had a counselor that said, then go find out where they do space stuff. Sounds really simple, right? Didn't dawn on me. I had to have a counselor tell me, go find out where they do space stuff. And that's what brought me back to Huntsville. I went to graduate school here, got my master's degree, and then started working at NASA. And I've got to work on some really cool things. I don't know how many of you remember, but a few years ago when we knew the shuttle was going to be retired, we weren't going to have the shuttle anymore, so NASA started working on the next generation vehicle. And at the time it was called Ares. So I was working on the Ares rocket. I was working on designing the rocket that was going to replace the space shuttle. I was a real rocket scientist, which never would have happened had I not come to space camp. Problem is that project got cut. Funding got cut. No more Ares rocket. So I had to figure out what I was going to do with my life. That's when I went down and started working in the Payload Operations Center. You've seen it out here. You guys probably walked through the Science on Orbit exhibit in the museum. That's where I work, the real one. I am a PACOM. How many folks in this room during your missions were either a PACOM or a CAPCOM? That's what I do for a living. And you know where I got the best training for it? Right here at space camp. Yes, I went to college. Yes, I learned all kinds of cool things. But it all led me to come here and be a PACOM. Instead of me paying to go to space camp to be a PACOM, they pay me to be a PACOM. So it's really cool. I've also got to do a whole lot of other cool things along the way. I never set out to be a PACOM. That's not what I thought. My degrees are in chemistry and material science. So I have a science background. Do I need a science background to be a PACOM? Not really. Does it help? Oh, yeah. Because when the astronauts are calling me down, I was on console today. I left console to come here. So I was talking to astronauts today, Peggy Whitson and Jack Fisher. That's what I did all day. Do I need to have a science background? No. When they call and ask questions about the science experiments they're doing on the station, can I answer them? Yes, a lot of the times I can because I went to school and studied science. I didn't have to wait for somebody to give me the answer. So that was a lot of what I learned along the way. I didn't go, set out to be a PACOM. I just wanted to do space stuff. And now I think I get to do a lot of really cool space stuff. So my message to you guys is decide what you're passionate about. It's not always going to be space or aviation. Decide what you're passionate about and do everything you can do to reach that goal. You may not end up where you thought you were going to. I wanted to be an astronaut. I kept working to be an astronaut. Didn't quite make it, but I get to work with astronauts every day. Two of the, two of the three astronauts that are here today, Dottie Metcalf, Lindenberger, and Clay, they both spent time on the space station. I get to work with folks like them every single day. So if you work towards whatever you're passionate about, you may not end up where you think you want to go, but wherever you get, you're never going to regret the journey and the effort and the work you put into it because you're going to end up in a really cool place. And you never work a day in your life if you love what you do. And I can honestly say, I love what I do. So go follow your passions, and you'll have a wonderful life. And now it's my honor to hand over to Mr. Robert Perlman. Hi, everyone. Um, like Penny said, my name is Robert. Um, I'm the uh, less handsome one on the left, I guess. Um, but yes, that's, that's my Muppet me. Um, so, like Penny said, uh, or actually Penny stole my origin story, um, but no, we share a, a similar background in that Space Camp the movie really hooked me into, uh, into coming here. Um, but truth be told, the day that Space Camp came out in the theaters and we went as a family, my dad took me, I didn't really want to see Space Camp, I wanted to see Karate Kid. My dad thought it was a little too violent for my age at the time, so he said, we're going to go see Space Camp. But by the end, I was determined that I wanted to come here and, and sat through the credits 
like Penny, and found that it was filmed here and, and came. Um, so I uh, had already been interested in space. I took astronomy courses at my local Y um, and had read just about anything that I could get my hands on. Um, but it was space camp that really solidified a passion for space um, that has lasted my entire life. Um, I went six times between 1987 and 1992. Um, I attended space camp twice, then moved on to Space Academy 1 at the time, um, and then Space Academy 2, which was a college credited course, which almost got me to go to University of uh, Alabama. You got one credit for coming to, to Space Academy 2, and that to me was like the best thing ever. Um, I thought, well, that, I'm just going to put that on my astronaut application and I'll be in. So I, what it did solidify uh, for me coming here was that I wanted to be an astronaut. And um, life had different plans. About the same time that I started coming, I was diagnosed with a chronic illness and had to be hospitalized for months on time and had very serious surgery. Um, I had the space camp as my reward or more my goal to get out of the hospital every year to come here and, and escape for a week. And so it not only put a direction in my life, but it in, in some ways it saved my life. Because if I had not had the drive to want to get out of the hospital, um, well, they told my parents at one point that they didn't expect I'd ever leave. And so I owe a lot to the space camp experience. Um, the, uh, while I was here, I, had, um, I, I attended space camp here five times and one time at the uh, space camp in Florida and uh, was happy to win the Outstanding Trainee Award two for two of my experiences um, and, uh, and even got written up in our, our local um, uh, New Jersey Star Ledger. Anyone here from New Jersey? Ah, there we go, a couple of Garden State. So, um, did I skip one? No. Okay. Um, so I, I did end up going towards the astronaut track. Um, I attended the University of Maryland at College Park and uh, went into astrophysics. Um, was still pursuing the astronaut path when I realized that the surgery that I had had as a kid would basically rule me out from ever being NASA material. Um, and at the same time that I was attending college, the web became a thing. Um, we were the first class to receive one megabyte of disk space uh, to establish a website. And I was in the right place at the right time and established the first non-NASA space website, which was called SPACE, S-P-A-C-E, um, the Space Planetary and Astronomical Cyber Experience because back then we were really geeky. Um, and so uh, I switched majors into English. Um, I started writing about the space program. I was able to develop websites for Buzz Aldrin the first, uh, on the first crew to land on the moon. I did the website for Tom Hanks' From the Earth to the Moon series and then established my own website called Collect Space, which at the time was just going to be a a playground for me to play and develop my own, my own projects. But in the, at the same time, went to work for a company called Space Adventures, which if you haven't heard of it, it's a space tourism group that was success, has successfully launched seven people, one of them twice, to the International Space Station. Uh, and uh, they paid their own way to go. Uh, the starting price when we started was around $20 million. And, at the end, it was closer to 50. Um, and they were from all walks of life. They were individuals who, uh, one of them was the co-founder of Cirque du Soleil. Another was the son of a Skylab astronaut, the first second generation astronaut. Um, and as we were doing that, I found a real passion for telling the story of how uh, we are all intertwined within space. So I, in 2005 went full-time as becoming a journalist and started to dedicate writing about the space program from a perspective that other people weren't covering, how history has influenced today's space exploration efforts. 
So real quick, I, uh, I, we had a, a site called starport.com, which was sort of how do you take astronauts and make them into uh, the, the uh, stars of advertising and in education, and continued to build CollectSpace, and today CollectSpace is the largest uh, online source for space history news as well as the space history community. Um, outside of my professional career, I work with uh, the Mars Generation, uh, which works to send underprivileged uh, uh, kids like yourself, in well, kids from all around the world, to space camp here, and, uh, and also with the Space Camp Hall of Fame to raise money for scholarships. Um, my message to all of you would be, a lot of times when we talk about space exploration, it's about uh, going into math and science and, um, and really focusing on STEM. And that's really important, and if that's where your career and your passion take you, then, uh, then please do follow that. But if you find yourself moving into the humanities, if you if you're find yourself liking to write about it more, or to paint about it, or to do any other type of activity around space, but that's not specifically around the sci uh, science, there is still ways to get involved in the space program. I get to work every day around astronauts, as Penny said. I get to work around uh, the latest happenings in NASA, and, and I get to do that as both my passion and my profession. Thank you. Here's, and here's Andrea Hansen from the class of 2010. All right, thank you, Robert. Can I have that clicker, please? Thanks. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, Space Camp. What an honor and a thrill it is to be back home here at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. So, so great to be with you all this afternoon. I'm Dr. Andrea Hansen, and I'm visiting here from Houston today, but I haven't always lived in Houston. I actually grew up in Minnesota. Anyone from Minnesota in the room? Yes, we got one. But more importantly, I grew up in a really small town in Minnesota. How many of you are from towns with populations less than 10,000 people? Okay, how about less than 1,000 people? How about less than 800 people? All right, that, that was Lake Park, Minnesota. Four hours north of the big city of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, that's where I grew up. Needless to say, we weren't talking about space a whole lot up there. We were a very rural, rural community with a lot of farmers. We had our bankers, our doctors, our teachers, and that was pretty much our community. So I didn't know about space. We didn't talk, I certainly didn't know about space camp. Um, but we did have a great education system and I had some great mentors and great teachers and a really supportive family. And I got a really great education up in Minnesota and I decided um, during, as a junior in high school, after a visit to the 3M factory, how many of you know what 3M makes? What's that? Yep, MMM, and they make the post-it note. I won a trip to the 3M factory and I got to look at the post-it note under an electron scanning microscope. I thought that was pretty cool. I had a chance to make an adhesive and in my group of four, mine was the stickiest. I made sticky tape and decided then and there I was gonna be a chemical engineer. So that's what I did. I went to the University of North Dakota planning on being a chemical engineer. Yeah, go Sue. <laughs> we have a couple of UND alumni in the room. So at that point, I was on my pathway to what we would call the home and transfer approach to life, a very efficient orbital transfer, getting to point A, from point A to point B. Little did I know that the experiences I was going to encounter along my way, including being here at space camp, was going to turn into more of a tra trajectory like that of the Cassini orbit. How many of you are familiar with the Cassini pathway? They're, they've been in the news lately. This is an amazing mission that start, launched in 1997 and will come to an end this September as it crashes into the surface of Saturn. Very cool trajectory, very cool science mission in orbit, and it was only planned for an initial 10 years. They extended that mission um, year after year because of really smart design from orbital mechanics designers and mission planners. So how did I get there? How did I get on that crazy Cassini-like orbit? Well, it, 
was after a series of experiences in really great organizations that I got to be a part of. When I got to the University of North Dakota, I ran into a friend who had just spent a summer working at space camp. I was like, tell me about this space camp. I've never heard of anything like that before. And he convinced me that I needed to apply. So as a sophomore in college, for the first time, I'm hearing about this amazing special place called space camp. I came down and got to work as an advanced academy counselor. And that was the first time that I really knew what it was to run a shuttle mission. That was the first time I knew that the United States was building a space station. That was the first time I started learning about the physiological adaptations that our body goes through when we go to space and live in space. That we lose muscle mass, that we lose bone strength. Not only was I learning that, I got to teach that. I was giving lectures and lessons in the same topic areas. And that was brand new information to me. How many of you heard for the first time this week at space camp that you lose bone and muscle strength when you go to space? Yeah, absolutely. How fascinating is that? So that really stuck with me. It stuck with me so much that I turned down a wonderful job offer from Dow Chemical Company to go to graduate school. And I went on to the University of Colorado to study bioastronautics and microgravity sciences. I didn't even know that was something you could study until I came to space camp. So that was something that space camp hoped, helped to open my eyes to. So here I was um, at the University of Colorado as a graduate student. Over the time there, I got to fly two different science projects on, space, on the space shuttle. And one of them was to test a pharmaceutical agent or a drug that would protect against muscle loss strength or muscle strength losses. A second one protected against bone strength losses. So I carried those lessons with me, and I actually got to test them in outer space. I went on to the University of Washington, where I worked in a biomechanics laboratory to understand how it takes, what it takes to design exercise hardware and equipment to keep our astronauts healthy. And then I got a job at NASA. Can you believe it? I still can't believe it. I drive through the front gates every day, and they let me in, and I get to go work as the manager of the Exercise Physiology and Countermeasures Lab. When I first started there, my title was Countermeasures Operations Specialist. I didn't even know that was a job. So my message to you is, don't, you don't know what you don't know until you start to experience life. And so you start working with teams and interacting with people from all over the country and all over the world. You're not going to know that these opportunities are out there. So I want to congratulate all of you for being here at Space Camp this week. And I hope that you take these friendships and these relationships that you're making this week and carry them with you. Keep in touch with your teammates because you never know when you're going to run into somebody in industry or when you start looking at your career and you want to follow the same, a similar path. So today, I'm really lucky to continue to work with the Space Camp programs. I get to serve as the co-chair of the Alumni Advancement Board, our board with Ben Chandler as our chair. And he's opened some really great opportunities to help raise money for scholarships to send kids like you to camp. I am in the Space Camp Hall of Fame, inducted in 2010. And I work with other space groups, like the Houston Association for Space Science and Education. So even in my hometown, I get to talk to large student groups just like you and share the stories that I learned starting here at Space Camp. So congratulations. I hope you had an awesome week, and I hope you keep coming back year after year. We'll see you at NASA. And next up, actually, I would like you all to just start clapping your hands for me. And please welcome to the stage, Lieutenant Colonel Burke Hare, class of 2011. Hi. <laughs> I'm a Lieutenant Colonel Burke Hare, Burke Wild Hare. Uh, I retired from the United States Air Force. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, my story. So, that's Andrea. There we go. There we go. I, there was no space camp when I decided I wanted to be an astronaut. I did it on my own. Read books. Uh, watched some TV. There was these shows called Space 1999. There was this show, if you don't know about Space 1999, you can watch it on YouTube. It's real, some of it's really good, some of it's really bad. But it's, but it's good. It's about a moon base a moon base, so it's really exciting. And, you know, that was a great show. And then some Star Trek, too, I guess. 
So I came in 1984, space camp started in 1983. So I'm kind of like one of the first people to come through space camp. Space, everybody know where HAB2 is? HAB2, right? That was it. That was it. The top side of HAB2 was the, was a different, had a different top side, but that was it. The downstairs part of HAB2 is the original space camp, and that's all there was. I got to be a flight director. Uh, so you can see me over there. That's me right there, uh, sharp-looking fella. This was our space shuttle. This was our space shuttle. This was it. You see it right there? That's it. That was this one picture, that's space camp. That's it when I came through, pretty much, okay? Uh, I got to come back in 1986. That was a very interesting time. Uh, the Challenger space shuttle exploded in January of 1986, and I was here in the spring of 1986. And we didn't know if we were going to fly. It was just, it was very, it was a very tough time. And, it, you know, you sit there and you go, what, what's going to happen? But this camp, it's so positive, right? I mean, it's so reinforcing. To, 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 you knew that we were going to fly, and you knew America was going to go back, and you knew America was going to lead, and we were going to fix it, and we were going to go on and do great things. And that's exactly what we did. And that's me right there, 1986, good-looking fellow. By the way, you see that right there? That is the one and only time I ever got to wear a, flight suit, uh, a space suit, and it was here at space camp when I was here, that young fellow right there. That, I think, and Robert Perlman and I are looking at it, but I think that might be an Air Force manned orbiting laboratory space suit. And if it is, here's the ultimate irony. And I'll show you, it, it's, I'm an Air Force officer, and the only flight suit I ever, or the only space suit I ever got to wear was an Air Force space suit. So that's pretty cool. You, then I came back after I graduated from college at Auburn University, War Eagle. Uh, this is, I know where to roll it. Um, this is me right here at Aviation Challenge. This is one of my group of kids. Uh, I was actually a commissioned officer. The Air Force, there was this thing called the Cold War. The Cold War ended while I was in college. And basically, essentially, the Air Force said, we'll call you, Lieutenant. Congratulations. Go on. So I said, this is crazy. What am I going to do? All my friends went off to go get, real, to, to go get hard, hard jobs working in UPS and stuff. I said, you're kidding me. I'm going to go where I can go where I'm going to get to play with toys. I get to hang out with college-age women. And... I get to do some really cool stuff that I did as a kid. Who wouldn't want to do it? They're going to pay me and feed me and do everything else. It's brilliant. So let me tell you something. Being a, being a counselor at the Space and Rocket Center is a really cool thing. So if you come back to do that, it's fantastic. It's counsel, these, these, these counselors, these crew trainers you've got are fantastic. <laughs> so, so, so what did I do? I joined the, I wound up joining the United States Air Force, and I wound up finding myself in the other space program. Yep, I was in America's space program, but not NASA. I was in the Department of Defense, the United States Air Force space program. I was assigned to Air Force Space Command, and I became a space and missile operations officer. So I got two jobs that I got to do. One job I got to do was associated with the Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missile, right there. You know, the ones with the biggest, baddest bombs on the planet? That was me. So, this one right here, everybody's like, we got all, you know, we've got all these planes and stuff, we're going to send them like, what? I could do it with one bomb. But anyway, uh, this right here, I was an ICBM maintenance officer first. Not, doesn't sound like a lot with space, does it? I was in Grand Forks. North Dakota, and I'm here. But you know what the Air Force did while I was a missile maintenance officer? First of all, what's a missile? It's a rocket. It's a rocket with a payload. It just happens to have a weapon on the top of it. Solid propellant, hypergolics, guidance sets. My guys, we had 17-year-olds. I was 23 years old as a lieutenant, and I had 70 folks working for me, ladies and gentlemen, and our job was to maintain these, transport them, bring them home safely, and uh, assemble them and disassemble rockets. Very powerful rockets. I got my master's degree at the University of North Dakota while I was there. The Air Force sent me to North Dakota. I said, oh my gosh, I'm in North Dakota. I'm from, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. They sent me to North Dakota. 
All right, we got some Atlanta people. We got some Atlanta people. All right, good. I'm a Cobb County person. I'm a Cobb County person. All right. I'm not that these Peachtree City people, these new people. All right, so, so anyway, what I want to tell you guys is I had no idea that one of the leading degrees in, in space is at the University of North Dakota, and the Air Force paid for me to go to it. How about that? Then the Air Force allowed me to do something really cool. I got to actually operate the global positioning system, command the global, global positioning system. This is a crew that I was assigned to. There I am right there. That's when I first started out. This is my crew commander, Mike Todaro, and my job was to take care of, th of up to 31 spacecraft in six different orbits at medium Earth orbit. The orbital period is 12 hours in six different orbits, 17,000 miles an hour. So with all deference to my astronaut friends, they have one spacecraft, I had 31. I just wasn't on board. Here I am, here's a picture of me at the command and control console. This is a down now, this is a decommissioned antenna that I actually sent my commands to and from these spacecraft at Kennedy Space Center. So if you ever get to go to the Patrick Air Force Base uh, Museum, this is an actual antenna that I got to command GPS on. Does everybody know what GPS, anybody heard of GPS? Let me say hands. Okay, yeah. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so then I got to do some other stuff. I got to go back and actually be responsible for launching these missiles upon uh, direction of, command of the President of the United States. So that was another job I got to do. And then when I finished that, I got a bunch of other space nuclear missile defense stuff. What I do today, I've retired from the Air Force, and my last job in the Air Force was in missile defense, and I decided to stay in missile defense. I'm local. I'm here. I'm here. I live in Huntsville, and I'm part of the missile. I, I support the Missile Defense Agency, and I get to do some really cool space stuff at the Missile Defense Agency. So I've been able to continue to work at that in space stuff, not at NASA, which is really cool. So I, the big takeaway here is... I don't, want to I don't want to say don't go to NASA, but I'm telling you there's another space program and there's another way. There's another way to space beyond just NASA. There's commercial also. So there's commercial, there's civil with NASA, and you can even serve your country in uniform and actually operate in commands and launch rockets, spacecraft, and actually operate them. So. I come over here from time to time and get to brief and talk to you guys. I've been able to help Dr. Barnhart and her leadership team on some Tiger teams to help improve the Space and Rocket Center from time to time. I've, I've been able to stay with my roots with the Air Force Association. It's really important to, to stay connected with those that gave you the opportunities that you have. I'm associated with a, with a group called the Air and Space Missile Defense Association. I'm on their scholarship selection committee for the Space Camp Scholarships. I, every year, I do the Human Exploration Rover Challenge, which was called the Mo Great Moon Buggy Race. Uh, everybody familiar with that? Everybody heard about that? Right? If you ever get a chance to be here to volunteer or, to be, or go and get your school in this thing, it's, it's awesome. I mean, it's mind-boggling awesome. And, of course, I'm a member of the Space Camp Hall of Fame. I had an opportunity to uh, sit on the Alumni Advancement Board last year, and I also uh, played a role in, the, scholar in the, the Space Camp Scholarships. I think my big message I want to show you is this. This picture here, this is me from a couple of, from a couple of weeks ago. This is my buddy Shane Kimbrough. Has anybody heard of Shane Kimbrough? Shane Kimbrough? Yeah. So Shane, I'm the class of 1988 from my high school. Yeah, I'm old. Uh, class of 1988. This Shane is the class of 1985 from my high school. So Shane and I knew each other in high school. And the important message and takeaway of this is, th is this. Shane was an astronaut. He, did a, he went through the Army and went kind of the traditional route to space. Army, test pilot, combat, combat veteran, astronaut. I went a different route. I went into the Air Force and I wound up in, uh, in ICBM maintenance, ICBM operations, and I got to do a lot of really cool space operations stuff, world-changing stuff. Got it. Was not going to happen. Find a way. Find a way. Find a way. Because you can one day wear a flight suit like Ritz, too. 
And that's all I want to tell you about. So I'm going to turn it over to Vince Vazo. Thank you, Bert. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, this is a picture of me in front of the space shuttle on pad 39A. And I wouldn't have been able to stand there without going to space camp. And so I'll just tell you quickly about how, how I got there. So uh, first, uh, between the summer of my fourth and fifth grade, something really amazing happened to my third grade teacher. She went to space camp for educators right here. But when she came back the next school year, she went to all the classes and told all the kids about it. And this is also before the internet, but she was kind enough to say, if you call 1-800-63-SPACE, and I still remember it well, uh, they'll send you a brochure. Uh, that's something on paper for the kids. They printed it. Um, no website. But uh, they sent it to me, and then my parents were like, well, what would you like for your birthday? I'm like, I don't know. This is kind of expensive. So, but I showed them the brochure, and they thought it was great, and so they sent me uh, five times, and I owe them a lot for that. So I got to go to space camp five times. Uh, do we have any, like, multi-camp attendees, not just your first time? So, all right. We're lucky. We're lucky. Go home and thank them. Um, so space camp was great because it was okay to know things. You know, I'm a, I was a giant nerd then. I know it's no different now, but it, it was okay. But I didn't know everything, and I still don't know much at all sometimes. But that was okay, too, because you had great counselors. They taught me a bunch of stuff, and they sent me home with a bunch of great material because I didn't have a computer at home at the time. I'm old enough. Uh, but I had lots of a library card, and I had books that Space Camp sent me home. And from then on out, any time I could write a report at school on space or Space Camp, I did it. Because I don't like school. They made things just annoying. But, you know, if you want to go on and, and work at NASA, you got to eat your peas. So I ate my peas, and uh, any time I could work Space or Space Camp into that, I, I did so. And I actually, uh, one summer in college, I got to come and be a counselor myself. And uh, it's it was great fun, because instead of your parents paying to send you to camp, they pay you to go to camp. So uh, Space Camp also helped me get into one of the best engineering schools in the country, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, I wrote my, all my college entrance essays were on Space Camp and the kind of teamwork that you learn at Space Camp and how that's important. If you're an engineer, projects are too big to do by yourself. You can't, one person can't do it. You have to work as a team. And so Space Camp taught me that. And I got to tell college admission people that I understand this and I already have some great experience with that. And that, I think that's what got me in. Um, so uh, out of school, I got a job I wasn't so thrilled with. A lot of good engineers, but it wasn't a good fit for me. So I had to start looking around. What do I want to do? And still a giant space nerd, maybe the space program can use me for something. And I was looking around. Uh, NASA doesn't always hire engineers, you kind of have to get lucky, but NASA also hires a lot of companies to hire engineers to work with them. And at the time, for the space shuttle program, that was United Space Alliance. And I looked on their website for jobs, and I happened to find one right here in Huntsville, Alabama. And I found a great one. It was amazing, because I was working for uh, engineering photographic analysis at the Marshall Space Flight Center. And one of our responsibilities was to watch all of the shuttle footage, because NASA put cameras looking at every angle of the shuttle. As many, here are a couple, but any angle you can think of, NASA wanted to see it. NASA wanted to know, you know what happened while the shuttle was going to space. And so uh, my job, they made, they made me look at all that launch footage. So I got paid to go look at beautiful, gorgeous shots of the space shuttle launching every mission. Uh, and it was also very important because uh, prior to my starting, Columbia, we lost tragically a few years earlier. So NASA really wanted to know if anything out of the ordinary happened on a launch. Uh, this particular picture is from STS-118, and it's a little hard to see here, but there's a little bit of a debris spray where some foam hit a tile, and, and they lost a little chunk of a tile. And so it wasn't, uh, the crew was never in danger, but we knew they weren't in danger because we were able to see it happen. Once they're on orbit, we had the tools to get better pictures of the tiles uh, and figure out whether or not it might cause a problem. So when it was time for the astronauts to come back home on that mission, we knew they'd be safe. Uh, so... With the space shuttle program ending, so too did that job, but I was able to stay in Huntsville uh, and eventually get back into NASA. So I always like to tell people that like Marshall Space Flight Center is a wonderful place to work because I've worked at other places and they're not fun. It's really great to work at Marshall Space Flight Center. I, I highly recommend it. Um, 
So uh, when I'm not at Marshall, I, I do try to help out at Space Camp here as often as possible. Um, when I was in high school years ago, I started a website for, about Space Camp because I thought that was something that should exist. Named it haveone.com after where you know, Space Campers lived. And anytime Space Camp gets mentioned in popular culture or something, I just like to keep track of it and point it out. Um, and also just anytime events like this or when astronauts come to speak, you know, I think it's a really great thing that more people than what are, who are just in the room should get to see it. So at every, every opportunity, I, I try to go record that and put it on YouTube. Uh, additionally, uh, Space Camp, you know, video used to have to be stored on giant plastic tapes. And the shelf life of those isn't as good as your iPad. So uh, I've been working on digitizing those so that they can be uh, more easily accessible. And so there's a lot of great stuff from, you know, 35 years of Space Camp. Space Camp turns 35 this year. And so I'm trying to capture as much as possible before the tapes kind of are no longer readable. Um, so I've put a fair bit of time in there. Uh, as a member of the Space Camp Hall of Fame, we try to send kids on scholarship every year to Space Camp. And the primary means that we're able to do that is with an auction every year. So if any of the adults in the room, if you're coming to dinner tomorrow night, there will be a silent auction. Please bid early and bid often. Uh, we were able to send 16 kids to camp this year. So that was a record. It's great. Both on academic excellence and financial needs so that, you know, if, if some parents aren't able to afford to send their kids to camp, there's still a route to get kids here because it's a fantastic opportunity. I wouldn't have uh, had the opportunities I've had in life without Space Camp. Without further ado, I will pass the microphone over to my partner in crime on the auction tomorrow night. Again, please bid early and bid often. Michelle Lucas. Hi, I can't tell you how amazing it is to be back here. Every time I come back here, I get the chills because it was such an important piece of my life. And so a quick bit about me. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Let me put it to you this way. Now, only about 17% of students who come from my county actually go to post high school education. So when I declared that I was going to work in the space industry or become an astronaut, people thought I was crazy. I didn't exactly fit in. It was a little odd, a little weird. And then this magical movie, like you've heard from the others, Space Camp came out. And I was so excited. I go to my mom and I say, Mom, 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 there's this thing called Space Camp. I so want to go. Please, please, please. I don't know exactly what she said, but to paraphrase, it was along the lines of, Honey, that's lovely. I'm pretty sure it's more than $5. I'm pretty sure we can't afford it. So I wrote to Space Camp, asked them for a brochure. They not only sent me a brochure, they sent me a scholarship application. And so I was very fortunate to get to attend Space Camp on scholarship. I did come to Space Camp, Space Academy 1 and Space Academy 2. I know the names have changed slightly, but uh, they're same, same concepts. And I came on scholarship each time. And so I'm so grateful to the folks who helped make that happen. Uh, there's a picture of me, my first time at Space Camp. I love Miss Baker. I've been leaving Miss Baker. Um, I've been leaving Miss Baker bananas for a long time. I have, uh, it's a tradition. I know many others have uh, taken up on as well. I did receive the Right Stuff Award twice. I could tell you about my missions and all that good stuff, but that's actually not what was so important to me. What was most important to me was that Space Camp was the first place that I found my tribe. I didn't fit in anywhere else. I thought I was never going to fit in anywhere, and I came here. And this is the place that it was okay to be in love with space and to be the kid who wanted to know more and I knew facts and figures about rockets. And so I found my tribe. And I found people that actually, thanks to the joys of the internet, I can now connect with on Facebook. It's, it kept me um, passionate about space. I became a counselor at Space Camp in Florida. And I went to college and I studied aerospace engineering and communications. I got to fly on the KC-135, AKA the Vomit Comet, twice doing research. I like to tell everyone that I have an hour of weightlessness. It just happens to be about 25 to 30 seconds at a time. I went to work at the Johnson Space Center. First, I worked on the payload safety review panel where we got to review all of the payloads that were going to go into space. I then became a flight controller for the International Space Station. I was an ops planner, and I started getting to travel to amazing places I never would have expected. Went to Russia, Germany, Japan to train flight controllers, instructors, and astronauts such as Dottie and Clay. I've had the pleasure of working with them for a lot of years. I worked our underwater Nemo missions. I dove. The first time I ever dove was here. And I'll tell you a secret. 
when I came to space camp the first time, my mother was terrified because she didn't know how to swim, and so I had never had swim lessons. So the first time I was going to come to space camp, the first thing my mother did was go down to the YMCA and sign me up for swim lessons so she was sure I wouldn't drown while I was here. She was really concerned about that. She wasn't worried about me getting launched into space, apparently, but she was worried about me drowning. So I loved that job, but then it worked out for me that I got offered an opportunity to become an instructor. Um, as I mentioned, here I am with one of my expedition crews, some of my space shuttle crews. I got to crawl around in Endeavor. She wasn't on the pad, so I didn't have to worry about launching into space. She was in the OPF, but it was still pretty amazing. And I loved what I was doing. Loved, loved, loved what I was doing. But then kind of like Andrea's Cassini path, my world took a little bit of a turn, and I found out I loved working with students like you. And so I started doing more of that. I started an organization called Higher Orbits. We use space to get kids interested like you in STEM. And I started a management company for retired astronauts with a business partner. And so we founded the first ever National Astronaut Day last year on May 5th. I love space. I've always loved space. I feel so fortunate to be part of this family, and I hope that you have found your tribe being here as well. I'm thrilled to be part of the Space Camp Hall of Fame, largely because we love to raise money for scholarships for the students. So uh, did Vincent mention bit early, bit often? Um, there are items on eBay. There are items that'll be in the auction tomorrow night. We, it means so much to me since that was the only way I was able to come here was scholarship. Um, I run Higher Orbits, a nonprofit that uses space to bring space inspired, uh, that uses space and brings space inspired camps to the backyards of students across the country. And I'm a big geek at the end of the day. And I'm a big believer that space inspires. No matter what you want to do, space is incredibly inspirational. And so I thank you for letting me be part of this. And without further ado, to try and get us back on time, I will pass this off to our fearless leader, none other than Phil Ritz-Smith. Oh, look, it's me. Uh, all right, um, I'm your last speaker for the night, so you can actually wake up. You're almost getting ready to go, uh, at least for this part. I want to thank you for paying attention thus far, and uh, we're going to ask for a couple questions. So. Uh, you know, the folks that you've listened to, uh, or, you know, me at the end here, uh, if you have any questions for any of us, please let us know. Uh, as soon as I'm done here, we'll hit the question slide. All right. Um, it was me in fourth grade uh, with uh, a teacher, Jackie Terrell. She was all up into the space program. I didn't know much about it, and she got me very interested. Saw Space Camp the movie, like a bunch of you did. Saw Jinx, the little robot, going around Mission Control, going, Jinx, put Max in space. Jinx, must get Max back, you know. And I was like, that is the coolest thing. I want to go to Space Camp and get launched into space, because that's the only way I'm going to get there after I took calculus math classes in college and realized I wasn't going to be an astronaut. Um, I took a couple of uh, class. I went to the United States Air Force Academy for college. Um, well after my space camp and space academy education here. Um, started flying when I was 15. Um, what's the oldest age group we've got in here for campers? 12? Anybody 12, 13 years old? All right, so we've got any but 14? Couple. I started flying at 15. You can solo an airplane when you're 16. You can solo a glider when you're 15. You can get your pilot's license when you're 17. And uh, that's kind of the way I took it. Uh, a, a bunch of these folks um, stayed with the space program. I went into aviation. I became a fighter pilot. But Space Camp and Space Academy was what launched me into that career field. I was lucky enough to uh, go off to the Air Force Academy, uh, then off to pilot training where I was a distinguished graduate, and got my pick of the litter. I got to pick from F-16s, F-15Es, F-15Cs, A-10s, B-1 bombers, B-2 bombers, B-52 bombers, all that good stuff. The F-15 is what I wanted to do. I mean, who wouldn't want to go 1,500 miles an hour dropping 500, 2,000-pound laser-guided, GPS-guided bombs on bad guys? <laughs> GPS-guided. GPS-guided. 
All right, a uh, quick poll of everybody here. Does anybody have a relative, mother, father, brother, sister, uh, that is in the United States military? Air Force, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, we'll even count them right now. All right. So like, like my friend Josh here, uh, you know, we in the F-15, we were the support asset for Josh. When he was on the ground in Iraq, uh, his fellow soldiers, Marines, airmen, uh, sailors that were on the ground in Afghanistan, we weren't the mission. We were there to support those guys. So when they started getting, you know, shot at by snipers or IEDs or, you know, going off around them, we're up in the air supporting them. They were the mission. They were the guys on the ground getting things done. But we were there to back them up with our 20 millimeter Gatling gun in the airplane flying over to 1,000 miles an hour to scare the bad guy away. Uh, I got to deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, support those guys on the ground that were doing the mission. After that, I spent 2008 and 2009 as the Air Force's F-15 air show demonstration pilot. I got to go to 69 air shows in about two years, showing people what the F-15 could do. Best job you can ever imagine, going to air shows and just getting to show off in your F-15 and not having to pay the gas bill. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't afford it. The Air Force didn't pay me enough for that. Um, after that, uh, I went back into Iraq uh, at, on the ground for a year as a general's aide, following him around, carrying his bags and learning. Um, after that, I went to fly F-16s as an aggressor guy. I'm sure everybody in here has seen the historical documentary, uh, Top Gun. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tom Cruise is a little bit older now, probably a little bit shorter like me. Um, we're about the same size, but um, Top Gun, you got to see the, the bad guys, the aggressors, what we call them. That's what I did in Alaska. I flew camouflage painted F-16s, and I got to play bad guy so that the good guys uh, could practice shooting me down, uh, and that was a hoot up in Alaska. After that, I called it an active duty career. I'm currently a reservist, so I'm a weekend warrior, a part-time Air Force guy at MacDill Air Force Base at U.S. Central Command Headquarters. But I'm a 757, 767 pilot for Delta Airlines uh, over in Atlanta. Based in Atlanta, live in Atlanta, and have a little airplane that I fly for. We got an Atlanta crew? Do we have anybody that lives in Locust Grove, Georgia, on the south side of Atlanta? Oh, Bill. <laughs> it's on the south. What about Tampa, Florida? Do we have anybody from Tampa? Where's Tampa? Who's from Tampa? Let me, let me get a hand here. All right, come on down. Up there. Come on down. From Tampa? You're not from Tampa. Then don't raise your hand when I say it's from Tampa. <laughs> Who's from Tampa? Nobody. You're from Tampa in the red? From Florida? All right. Well, this is uh, in the Air Force, we have coins that we carry around. And uh, this one is from my deployment in 2005 and 2006 over to Iraq. So it's got some Arabic on the back, and it's got this patch on the back. That's this patch that I'm wearing right here. And uh, it's a tradition that we carry our coin around. Uh, so I would like you to have the coin that we've been carrying around. And I've got one. And uh, there's a tradition behind it where if you have your coin, and you show me your coin, and I don't have mine with me, then I owe you a Coke. <laughs> if I do have my coin and you pull it out, and you challenge me, it's called a challenge coin. If you have it, and you pull it out, and you challenge me, and I have it, well, then you owe me a Coke. So be sure to keep it on you for uh, future reference here. All on behalf of everyone here at Space Camp, um, you know, you've all heard this. This is, uh, we're in the Space Camp Hall of Fame. Our goal is to raise funds for future scholarships so that uh, others can attend space camp that might not be able to afford it. And don't forget, no matter what you're doing, whether you're in the GPS satellite system, whether you're a city councilman, whether you're uh, you know, a 757 pilot at Delta Airlines, everyone is a demo something. Do the best at what you do. I don't care if it's digging ditches, uh, asking would you like fries with that, or going up into space, be the best at what you do, and love what you do. Thank you very much. 
I don't think we have time for questions, do we? What's that? We don't have time for questions, but on behalf of uh, the Space Camp Hall of Fame, uh, if you have any questions, come down to the front. We'll uh, talk to you here. Uh, Dr. Barnhart, thank you very much for hosting us. We really do appreciate it. Ben Chandler, thank you very much.